I gather you are going to Diddlington once term is over, Professor, said young Victor Eckhart to Professor Sir Lancelot Thickbroom, Doctor of Anthropology, as they partook of Christmas dinner at the high table in the ornate dining hall of St. Bono's College, Oxbridge. And being a man of few words, Thickbroom replied with a nod. As meticulous as he was in his eating habits as in his dress, the Professor Doctor concentrated on cutting up the food on his plate into equal measures with almost surgical precision, before forking each morsel adroitly into his mouth so as not to brush against his impressive handlebar moustaches. Thus engaged, he did not see Eckhart roll his eyes. Why do I persist? thought Victor to himself, trying to engage Thickbroom in conversation was almost always akin to pulling teeth. Yet he was strangely fond of the old duffer, under whose tutelage he had once studied before becoming a teacher himself, and it was the Christmas season after all, good will to all men and all that. Professor Thickbroom was not exactly old, barely middle-aged, in fact. He simply acted as if he were. Eckhart persisted. I understand it is your habit to spend Yuletide recess in that same location. It is, yes, Thickbroom answered. Three words in succession. This was progress. Victor pressed his advantage. And why would that be? Because I can be guaranteed solitude, he replied, but with just the slightest twinkle of good humour in his eye. Eckhart, similarly amused, was encouraged to proceed with his interrogation. But surely at Christmas, Christmas, the professor replied, is a time for quiet contemplation, and contemplation, I'm sure you will agree, Mr. Eckhart, is best done alone. That's such a pity, Eckhart replied. Why, pray? Because I myself am spending Christmas and the New Year with family and friends in Peppercoats, just along the coast. I thought I might pop across one afternoon and keep you company. The professor grunted amiably. By all means, Eckhart, but I fear you will find Diddlington very dull. It is mostly shut down in winter, and not very lively in the summer, truth be told. Then added, Now, where is my pudding? I must have my pudding. Diddlington, a sea-fishing port and coastal town, nicknamed the Crustacean Capital of England, had increasingly become a popular holiday destination, especially since the local railway station had opened in 1847. Out of season, however, its hotels and boarding houses were largely shut down for the duration, though Fortunately, the hostelry the professor favoured was open all year round. On the day following the Christmas feast, Thickbroom executed his plan, arriving at Diddlington Station in the late afternoon, with his hefty trunk and other belongings hoisted on the back of a hired dog-cart. He was driven the short distance to the Fisherman's Friend, where he was greeted warmly by the innkeeper Skidders and his good lady wife and shown to his customary room by the housemaid, Myrtle. He immediately made himself at home again, unpacking his trunk and distributing his belongings to their usual place. He dined alone, as was his wont, and went to bed early with a copy of Masterson's A Teleological View of Social Evolution to hand for a bit of light reading, though the sea air, having worked its magic, meant he soon doused his bedside candle and fell into a deep, restful sleep, untroubled by dreams of any sort. He awoke feeling thoroughly refreshed, and, having attended to his toilet and eaten a hearty breakfast, wrapped himself up in multitude layers against the cold before venturing out to reacquaint himself with the locale. The sky was grey, and hung heavy with the threat of snow, and the ground under his polished boots had a crisp film of frost upon it. To the north of the village, at some distance along the coast, he could just make out the seaside town of Peppercoats. To the south lay the barren cliff-top. He strolled along the seafront a little way in a southerly direction, then turned into a warren of streets where he knew shops were to be found. 
he first treated himself to a quarter mixture of boiled sweets from the confectioner and sucked on one as he continued to meander. He knew these streets like the back of his hand, little having changed since his boyhood when the family had first spent Christmas here. Yet there was a shop he had surely never seen before, and it took him quite by surprise. The shop stood alone down a side street, surrounded by merchants' offices. The weather-beaten fascia above the shop-front read, The Queer and the Curious, and, as he drew nearer, he could not help but notice that the window display was virtually obscured due to the grime on the interior of the glass panes. He peered through the murk, squinting to get a better view of the objects on display, but could make out no detail. However, he was sufficiently intrigued to venture in. The bell above the door tinkled as he entered. It was, as he might have guessed, an old curiosity shop, with a wealth of oddities in every corner and piled up to the ceiling. There did not appear to be any order to the items on display, only volume. With no shopkeeper in attendance, he began to browse, and was all the time befuddled as to how he had never come across the shop before. On occasion he would pick up some object from a pile of other objects and examine it. There were ancient tomes, play-worn toys, dusty piles of periodicals, objets d'art, and... Amongst the articles on display, something glinted and caught his eye, and he took down from the wall, for reasons he could never adequately explain thereafter, a cup of some kind by the looks of it, relatively shallow for a drinking vessel, though perfect for use as a bonbon dish, and, with his sweet tooth, the professor was always on the lookout for suitable objects to store a bonbon or two. Only a corner of the metal object glinted. The greater part was tarnished by age. Turning it over in his hand, he saw some form of engraving, but was prevented from examining it further by a sudden tugging at his elbow. He looked down and was surprised to see the upturned face of what he could only assume was the short, squat, and deeply unattractive proprietor. "'Found something to your liking, sir?' It wasn't so much a question as a statement. The proprietor continued, his smile revealing an even set of yellow teeth, by way of an introduction. Uriah Goldstone, owner and occupier of this humble establishment, at your service. Yes, about that, Thickbroom began. I have been a frequent visitor to Diglington since childhood, and have never before seen your shop. Can you explain? "'Why, no, sir,' Goldstone replied. "'Tis a mystery. "'I've been here since Adam was a lad.' "'Thickbroom frowned, but Goldstone, intent on a sale, "'simply pointed to the object. "'That's a very interesting piece you have there. "'Very interesting, very unique.' "'Again, the professor turned it over in his hand. "'I was just wondering what it is.' Ah, Goldstone began, it is a rare survivor of the heraldic age. Tis a knight's codpiece, worn in battle to protect his... Yes, Thick Broom held up his hand to prevent any further unnecessary explanation, but to his own surprise found himself asking, And the price? What would you like to pay, sir? A reasonable price. I do not barter. Having purchased the item at what he considered a bargain price, Thick Broom exited the shop with the article wrapped in tissue and stored securely in his knapsack. In pursuit of solitude, the professor took a long walk along the low cliff top to cleanse his pipes with the salt sea air and contemplated at length the enormity of the sea that stretched out before him. He ate his packed lunch in the welcome shelter of a natural grotto, then endeavoured to walk it off before finally returning to his lodgings, just as the afternoon light was fading. After a restorative bath, he dressed and dined in his room. He was fingering his purchase of earlier that day when Myrtle sidled in with his tray, and he asked if she would be so kind 
as to make a thick paste from vinegar, flour, and salt, and bring it to him, this being the preferred solution to clean heavily tarnished items. A good scrub with this mild solution should be enough to restore the article to its former glory, he reasoned, and, in due course, he applied the paste to the stubborn tarnish, let it sit for about ten minutes, then rinsed it with clean water, and dried it by hand. The change was remarkable. The metal shone, and the inscription on the inner surface that had previously been obscured came into stark relief. It read, Sicalis convenit veritas nocet. His Latin was not as assured as it had once been, but still, he did not struggle with the translation. If the cup fits, the truth hurts. Curious indeed. And the professor made a mental note to return to the curiosity shop to see if Goldstone could add any further light on its ancestry. For now he laid the gleaming dish on his bedside table, and emptied into it what remained of the quarter of boiled sweets that he had purchased that morning. It was a pitiable sight, as the quantity of sweets looked depressingly small, whilst the codpiece seemed unusually large in all its glistening splendour, and he resolved to buy a half-pound in the morning. Thick Broom did not sleep well that night. He dreamt of dried peas rattling around in a tin can, the roar of which was tremendous, like thunder, and he felt he was being pursued by the hand that shook it, leaving him with no alternative other than to flee into the night and, for want of an escape, dive into the bay and find silence in its watery depths. He was drowning now, his arms flailing and choking as cold sea filled his orifices, and, striking out reflexively, his arm must have caught the bonbon dish on the bedside table, as he woke with a start, as boiled sweets rained down upon his head. The professor was still out of sorts in the morning, and, declining breakfast, set out on a brisk walk along the seafront, in hope that the chill winds would blow any cobwebs clear from his mind. With his pockets replenished with bonbons from the confectioner, he set out to retrace his steps through the warren of streets to the place at which he was certain to find the queer and the curious. But, much to his chagrin, it appeared to have simply vanished. As a scientist he was not disposed to consider the supernatural, and so searched the neighbouring streets, but again without result. Reluctantly he returned to the point at which he had begun, and thence to accept the reality that, whilst the street was there and the merchant's offices were there, the curiosity shop was notable by its absence. He hurried back to the inn and found Myrtle in the kitchen drying the last of the breakfast things. "'Lord love us, sir,' she said, alarmed upon his entry, "'whatever is the matter, you look like you've seen a ghost.' If it were a question, he did not respond other than to pose his own. Are you, by any chance, familiar with a shop called The Queer and The Curious? Myrtle looked at him blankly. Why now, sir, not to my knowledge. Or Mr. Goldstone, Uriah Goldstone. Myrtle looked as though she might faint then and dropped the plate she held in her hand onto the flagstone floor, where it shattered into pieces. "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear! That's torn it!' she cried. Thick Broom invited her to sit at the kitchen table to collect herself, and poured her a cup of medicinal brandy from the flask he kept by him at all times. Once she had recovered her composure, she began. "'There is a legend, sir, goes back centuries, this—' Goldstone appears periodically, always around Christmas, and in many guises, sometimes a street hawker, sometimes door to door, sometimes a shop, but always selling something to an unsuspecting buyer, something that brings only doom. I was a girl when he last appeared. My Aunt Thora was in service to Lady Marjorie in the big house at the time, and it was Lady Marjorie who bought this grubby old Soutien Gorge brassiere off him when he accosted her in the street. She only bought it to get rid of him, she said. But once my auntie had washed it, it came up beautiful, it did. 
Then, three days later, Lady Marjorie was found strangled by it, and my poor Aunt Thora swung for the crime. Myrtle sobbed. But she loved the mistress. Uh, it couldn't have been her. Uh, oh, tell me you haven't seen him, sir. No. No, he lied, patting her hand warily. I just overheard a snippet of conversation, and he gave her a shilling which would more than cover the breakage. Retiring to his room to brood, the professor took the codpiece from the bedside table, and, placing it upon the writing desk, endeavoured to fill it with the half-pound of boiled sweets he had recently purchased, but was somewhat disgruntled to find there was still room left within the cup for more. He popped one sugared plum after another into his mouth, and considered the enigma. Lifting his eyes to the window, shelf clouds and roll clouds could be seen directly above the bay, forming the leading edge of a squall fast approaching. Within fifteen minutes the sudden sharp increase in wind speed brought vast plumes of lashing waves upon the seafront, and heavy snowfall fell from the frowning sky. Within a further fifteen minutes the squall had turned into a fully-fledged snowstorm, whose howling winds and blizzard-like conditions threatened to drag on for hours, if not days. It wasn't long thereafter that he heard the commotion from downstairs, with the arrival of weary travellers seeking shelter at the inn, and Mrs. Skidders and Myrtle being dispatched to prepare their bedroom accommodation. Blast it, he thought to himself. So much for Christmas solitude. He was to be further inconvenienced later in the day. Sir Lancelot was too preoccupied with his deliberations to note his visitor's entry into the room until he heard the door click shut at his back, and he turned to find young Victor Eckhart standing there. Eckhart was in a sorry state, half frozen and fatigued to the edge of his endurance. Brandy was administered, and once he had disrobed his sodden outer garments, a blanket was wrapped around his combination underwear, and he was seated by the blazing fire. The welcome light of an oil lamp further illuminated the scene. Thick Broom would have Skidders set up a fold-down cot for his guest in the corner of the room in due course, all other accommodation now being taken, for, in the circumstances, there was little to no chance of Victor returning to Peppercoats that night, and, having hung Eckhart's socks from the mantelpiece to dry, the professor administered a hearty foot rub to get the young chap's circulation going. "'Who knew you had such healing hands?' Eckhart moaned gratefully at the professor's ministrations. "'It is a skill I learned from the Inuit tribe, with whom I bonded on one of my scientific expeditions in the Arctic.' the professor replied, in a matter-of-fact fashion. They believe the soul of the foot is the mirror of the soul of man, and inextricably linked, you know. For example, if I press on this area, it will make you go. Oh, Victor groaned, as it stimulates your sense of inner well-being. And if I press here, ah, Eckhart whimpered, your vitality will be replenished. Yes, there our secrets known only to the ancients. We have much to learn from anthropology that can benefit all mankind. Feeling the deep and abiding benefit, Eckhart ejaculated, That's remarkable. We all have our areas of expertise, the professor replied with humility. You, for example. I understand you have knowledge of the heraldic tradition. I should hope so. Medieval history is my speciality. Would you like a bonbon? Victor looked puzzled, but nodded. There were but two left, and each took one before Thick Broom handed his visitor the empty dish. And would you happen to have any observations on this item? Eckhart turned it over in his hand. Where on earth did you get this? Is it rare? As hen's teeth, Professor, if I am not wrong, this is a knight's guard meant to protect his... Yes, yes, no need to elaborate. And age? Adult, I should think, by the size of it. I meant, can you date it? Oh, <laughs> Victor chortled. Early sixteenth century, I'd imagine, perhaps earlier. 
It is certainly the earliest example I have ever seen, and the craftsmanship. What a find! He caught sight of the inscription. How curious! Yes, if the cup fits. The truth hurts. Does it now? Well, we shall see. And before Professor Thickbroom could protest, young Eckhart had clamped the wretched thing over his own vitals. Victor leered uncharacteristically. Hmm, bit of a snug fit, but... And then came a shriek of excruciating pain as the guard began to undulate and steam began to rise from around the rim. Eckhart's shrieking escalated as he writhed in agony, whilst both men fought valiantly to yank the codpiece free, but to no avail. It was stuck fast and was searing to the touch. Sir Lancelot rushed to grab a jug of water from his water-stand, with which to douse young Victor's nether regions, but before he had a chance to throw it, Eckhart's combination underwear burst into flames with a woof. Lit like a flaming torch, the professor could only look on in horror, as the face of Victor Eckhart contorted in a silent scream, as his skin first cracked, then flaked, and finally burnt off and peeled away in great blackened strips. And it was at this point that the supernatural world fully intruded into the natural as, rising like a vulture from the ashes, a second figure emerged, that of Uriah Galston, naked and hideous to behold. You were dissembling, the professor cried. Yes, Goldstone screeched. I am the truth that hurts. And in that moment, Sir Lancelot knew that he himself was done for. It was only when young Victor Eckhart returned to St. Bono's after winter recess that he learnt of the freak accident that had befallen Professor Thickbroom, R.I.P., and led to his gruesome death. It was Maurice Groening, a junior professor who, appearing to take some perverse delight in sharing the grisly details, recounted over dinner at the very same high table where the professor and Victor had last dined, of how it appeared the professor had somehow tripped and fallen face first into a metal dish, thus clamping it to his face and blocking his airways and unable to remove it, had suffocated to death. It was, Croning added, only once a crowbar had been procured to prize said dish off Sir Lancelot's face that the true horror of his final moments were revealed, in the horrified expression that lay frozen underneath. And thus Victor had cause to regret not visiting for the day as promised, though the inclement weather had rendered it impossible. Still, it might have made all the difference. Thank you.